Good morning. Thank you for taking the time to worship with us today at City of Refuge Fellowship. Those of you who tune in often, you are already wondering, where are they? Um, we have been graciously and very kindly and generously, um, Grace Alliance Chapel has allowed us to use their space so that we can begin recording our online services. And so um, you'll be getting more details about that in the coming weeks, but um, for this week we have started and we will continue using the space here at Grace. And so we just wanna bless them and thank them for giving us the opportunity to use their space and for really just being partners um, for the work of Christ. And so thank you for joining us. Thank Grace for giving us a place to be. Um, and thank God that it is he who orders our steps. It is he who God our paths um, that when things change it may be a strange thing for us but it is exactly what God desired for us and so I want to welcome you again today and thank you for joining us I want to encourage you as I do so many times please don't just watch worship the lyrics will be there for the song sing along with us during the times of prayer please pray with us during the word we welcome you to leave comments even to ask questions as you go along through it and then finally for today we will be taking communion together and so i want to encourage you if you haven't done it already please get the elements together you are welcome to use any kind of bread any kind of cracker and any kind of juice it does not have to be exactly what you're used to um, for it to be the symbols of christ's body and of christ's blood but at the end of service today we will be taking communion together and i am excited for the opportunity to share with the body of christ both the blood and the body of jesus to remember together and proclaim together the death of Christ until the return of Christ. And so I'd ask you as we prepare to begin, get your elements ready. I pray, prepare your heart, prepare your house, and may we worship, may we pray, may we hear from God, and may we rightly eat from his table today. And so would you bow your heads with me and we'll begin our time together with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that you are good, and your love endures forever. We thank you today that you are sovereign, that you are in control. We thank you today that you not only made all things, but you continue to hold all things together. Thank you that the hearts of kings are like water in the hands of God. Thank you today that there is no one like you, and we have been given your name. And so I pray today, as your people gathered in your name and in your presence, I pray today that we would give you all of our attention, that we would give you all of our affection, that we would turn from ourselves and turn to you. Today, Lord, we give you our hearts, we give you our words, we give you our songs, we give you our attention, we give you all that we are, because you have given us all that we have. So I pray today, Lord Jesus, be lifted high. Heavenly Father, be adored. Holy Spirit, be listened to and walked with. May Jesus be glorified so that men can be redeemed. Have your way and be pleased. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. Father, we thank you today that not only are you sovereign in your power, but you are merciful in your heart. Thank you today that it is not only that you have control, but it is that you give mercy. Thank you today that you are patient, that you are long-suffering. Thank you that you are slow to anger, but you are rich in love. Thank you today that you are not just God Almighty, you are Emmanuel. You are not only the one who uses the earth as his footstool, you are the one who put on flesh and, and bowed and, and actually stooped to us. Thank you today that you are faithful and just, that you are righteous and kind. Thank you today that you are awesome and yet you are near. Thank you that there is nothing too difficult for you and yet you run to us in our difficulty. And so today, God, I pray for our hearts, that they would be set right in your presence and that you would be set right in our hearts. I pray today that we would look upon you rightly, that you, we would speak to you rightly, that we would call upon you rightly. I pray today that we would establish your place in our hearts rightly. I pray that you would sit on the throne of our hearts and the throne of our lives. I pray that you would sit on the throne of our loves and the throne of our affections. I pray today that you would receive everything that is due you from us. May we not be distracted. May we not be discouraged. But may we set our faces like flints upon you, upon the one who is good, upon the one who does not change, upon the one who will remain. So we thank you today. Thank you for loving us with an everlasting love. Thank you for throwing our sin as far as the east is from the west. Thank you that when we, even in our righteousness, fall down, you are there to scoop us up. And not just to dust us off, but to transform us and change us from what we have been into what we were meant to be. Thank you today that the sons of disobedience have become the sons and the daughters of God. Thank you today that we were your enemies and we have become your children. Thank you today that we were already condemned and we have been given new life. Thank you today that you dwell in us and you dwell with us. Teach us how to trust in you. Turn us and our lives and this world we live in upside down so that we can finally and rightly enter the kingdom of God. Have your way among us today. In the perfect and holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Good morning again. Thank you for joining us again today. It is good to be with you. It is good to have you here with us. For those that may have joined late, I will uh, share again. We are um, recording our online services today and going forward into the future um, here at Grace Alliance Chapel. Um, they have kindly allowed us to use their space during this season. Um, we've already been partners together on encounter nights of worship and prayer and in different things that God's been doing. And so um, God has just united our hearts in such a way that when we had a need, they were kind and generous and quick to respond to that need. And so we are grateful to Pastor Mike and Rachel and all of the leadership here um, at Grace Alliance Chapel. And we're grateful for the space. We're grateful to be here in this space. A reminder again, we will be taking communion near the end of service, and so please, um, if you have not already done so, prepare the elements. Um, today, because of communion, we will not be having our usual time of intercession because that prayer time will be held at the end of service. 
I do want to share some announcements with you today um, before we get into the scripture so that once we are into the scripture, we will go directly into communion and not, um, not let it allow it to be choppy in any way or any shape. Um, just a few things for you coming up this week, Wednesday night, we will have our next Revelation discussion, Book of Revelation discussion. Um, that's done via Zoom. If you would like to be a part of that discussion, just make sure that we have your um, email address. Um, so you can leave it for us there or you can send it to us in a message. Um, the invitation will go out sometime either late Tuesday or into the day on Wednesday. We will be discussing what we, what we taught this past week, which was Revelation chapter 7. Um, I believe it was verses 13 through the end of the chapter. So we'd love to have you join us um, for that time of discussion. I want to continue to thank you for your giving. Um, again, this week you provided groceries, you provided opportunities to be a blessing to people here in our community of Burlington um, as uh, we continue to partner as best we can with other churches, with the police department, um, with our city as uh, we make sure that those who have needs in our community um, have those needs met as well. But also again this week, you, your giving allowed us to send food relief to the Philippines, specifically to the island of Mindanao. Just today, I got an email from one of the missionaries in uh, General Santos that wanted to let me know so I could let you know that the money you sent this week went to food relief and the outreach this week, while food was being distributed, 36 people surrendered their lives to Jesus during that time. And so that is your giving in action, not only to feed bodies, but to change eternity. And so thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your willingness that in a time of uncertainty to be certain that God would use you to take care of the needs of others. And so um, it is an incredible blessing to know that sacks of rice are actually turning into souls. That those that are being fed in their bodies are also having their spiritual needs met. And so we will continue to give week after week. As you give, we will send it forward. Also, um, I know I told you last week you would get it. Things got a little crazy this week. So this coming week you'll get pictures and updates. But the first two projects that we talked about in the Philippines are already finished because of the giving that you've done. We've sent the materials to the first church that's being rebuilt. They have all the materials they need. Now it's just up to them to get it, the building finished. And then also the Sunday school extension, the addition to the other church that is both feeding children and then also having Sunday school, that is now finished. Uh, I can't wait to share the pictures with you of the before and the after, um, but your gifts are not only helping, they are changing things. They are actually moving mountains. And so thank you for your faith. Thank you for your generosity. I'd ask that you would continue to seek God and continue to give as he leads. Um, both here in Burlington, but also in the Philippines. And so today, if you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 2. And as you're turning there, things are a little bit different in what we're doing here. And so I mentioned earlier that we are recording. And so um, we are not live with you as we normally would be on a Sunday morning. But we are recording the service so that we can all take part in it together on Sunday morning. But one thing that I think is kind of interesting is this gives you a very unique opportunity. As is rarely capable of doing, I'm preaching this now, but I'll be watching it with you on Sunday morning. And so if you would like to interact with the preacher, you have the opportunity to ask questions, to leave comments, to uh, call me to task, or maybe even give me an attaboy. Um, but whatever you desire, I'll be right here and am right here with you. And so um, if you would like to make comments, please feel free. I will do my best to address them. But I promise you won't, I won't give any amens, um, and I won't give any you know, great job pastors in there. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll leave that to, the, to those who, uh, who are listening. Rather than, uh, rather than me. So if you have your Bibles open today, we're going to look at Acts chapter 2, verses 40 through 47. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 40, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. This is Luke writing, and he says, And with many other words, he, being Peter, testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. 
Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. At the end of 2018, both Amanda and I felt God speaking to our hearts the importance of Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and specifically the word devoted. After a lot of prayer and study and many conversations, we felt that God was leading us to make the word devoted our theme for 2019, not just for the youth group, but for our entire church body. Today, more than a year and a half later, after many more prayers, much more studying, more conversations, and possibly more sermons than many of you can remember, I want to talk to you about that word again, devote. As we step into a new season and face another transition, what I've learned and hope to share with you is that devotion isn't a theme, it's an identity. It's not something we do, it's who we are meant to be. And in the age of mission statements, vision, and values, which are all good and necessary things, I believe that God is asking us as a church to simply be one thing. Devote. We will get to Acts 2.42 and the church at Jerusalem in just a moment. But I actually believe that the story of devotion for the church actually begins in Luke chapter 2 verse 19 in the story of the birth of Christ. After the shepherds had come and found Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, they began to spread the word about the infant Messiah. The scriptures tell us that they went and told everyone they met about everything that they had seen. And it says, all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Verse 19 then says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. I love this picture of Mary. She must have been still unsure about what any of this means. Still not truly understanding how her life and all of eternity would change. But she was completely convinced that when what God had done was good and that what God had promised would come to pass. She didn't wrestle with her questions or run forward with her hopes and expectations. She was content with God's goodness. She was careful and consistent in her obedience to God's word. And she trusted God's character even when she didn't understand God's ways. None of it made sense. And yet what she did was rather than seeking answers, she just sat and pondered and treasured what she had seen what she had heard, but most of all, what she knew. We are constantly tempted to move on from our pondering, and we are susceptible to getting so busy that we forget to treasure. This is dangerous because when we cease to ponder and treasure what God has said, we end up living from our feelings, we live from our understanding, or we live for our own desires. We end up losing sight of who God is and what God has spoken and the reality that God is with us and we begin trying to meet our own needs. We try to fulfill God's will our way or we try to speed up the promises so that we can finally get to the fulfillment. In that stage, and we've all been in that stage at some point, time gets wasted and promises get forgotten, false narratives end up being believed and disappointment and confusion begin to take control. I just ask you today in your own life, how often do we run ahead trying to get where we think God is leading? How often do we hold his hand until we think we see the light and then we let go and run ahead knowing that we know what God wants? How often do we lag behind because we simply want to stay where we are or we'd like to get back to where we used to? I believe that Mary shared her gift of pondering and treasuring with Jesus. We see Jesus waiting. We see him moving carefully, even moving slowly at times. Jesus, we see Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of all things. We see Jesus praying all night long before he chose his 12 apostles. 
the one who knew who they would be from the beginning, was so careful and pondered and treasured so well that he spent the entire night not wrestling, but just praying, knowing what he would do, but wanting to sit with his father while they prepared to do it. We see Jesus not revealing himself as the Messiah to those apostles until they were nearly halfway through their time together. If it were me, that would have been my opening line. Follow me, I'm the Messiah. Follow me, I'm the Son of God. Follow me, I'm the one who created you. But instead what we see with Jesus is saying, follow me and I'll show you what you need to know. And I'll show you when you need to know it. Why do we tend to think that God is going to work differently in our lives than he worked in the lives of the 12 men that he chose to follow him here on earth? Jesus didn't say, follow me, here's all the details. Jesus said, follow me, and it will unfold. And yet you and I have this belief, we have this idea, we have this desire to see it unfold so that we can walk in it. And yet that is not how God works, because he's careful, because he's patient, not because he's slow, but because he ponders and because he treasures. We see Jesus watching the Father and only doing what he saw the Father doing, rather than doing what every man asked him to do. What Jesus learned from Mary, he then taught to his apostles. After Jesus ascended back to heaven, the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. They obeyed Jesus' command. They prayed. They watched. They believed that waiting for the promise of the Father was more important than going out and starting the work of the ministry. They did not fall into the trap of saying, we have to do something. Remember, Peter had already done that. After the resurrection of Jesus, Peter had already said, I'm going fishing. I can't sit here any longer. I can't wait any longer. I've got to go do something, and I'll go do something familiar. And so Jesus, in his kindness, and again in his patience, what does he do? He meets Peter where Peter went, even though Peter was supposed to wait where Jesus would be. We have to remember that God will meet us, but he's called us to wait for him. They had learned a lesson, and so rather than going and doing what everyone else wanted them to do, they stayed and waited and did only what Jesus had asked of them. They stayed together, pondering and treasuring Jesus' words and remembering Jesus' life, believing that Jesus himself would order their next steps, that their calling was to let his words go deep down into their hearts and to fan the flames of God's promises in themselves but also in each other. The apostles then passed this gift along to the first church, who then passed it along to every church through the words of Scripture. In Acts chapter 2, verses 40 and 41, we're told that Peter preached to great crowds on the day of Pentecost, and that 3,000 people accepted the message. They repented of their sins. They submitted their lives to Jesus. They were baptized and added to the body of Christ. Then in verse 42, we are told that those first 300 3,120 believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Mary's pondering led to Jesus' watching. Jesus' watching led to the apostles' waiting. And the apostles' waiting led to the first church's devotion. The first word that described the first church was devoted. The same word that I believe is supposed to describe our church and that is supposed to describe every church. So the question today has to be, what does it mean to be devoted? Strong's Concordance divine, defines the Greek word with tra we translate as devoted this way. To be steadfastly attentive unto, to give unremitting care to a thing, to continue all the time in a place, to persevere and not to faint, to show oneself courageous for, be in constant readiness for, wait on constantly. I know you don't have it in front of you, but think about those descriptive words that I've just used. Steadfastly attentive. Unremitting care. To continue all the time. To persevere. To be in constant readiness. To wait on constantly. See, devotion is about a continual action. Devotion is not giving it everything you've got one time. Devotion is giving it everything you've got all the time. Devotion is different than just effort. Devotion is when you make a commitment, and that commitment now guides the rest of your life. It is consistency. It is faithfulness. It is devotion. John Piper wrote that to be devoted is to seriously and earnestly persist in. 
To be, to, to be devoted is to be committed, to be consistent, to be faithful, to take hold of something or someone and not let go no matter how it goes or how we feel about it. Jesus was devoted to the Father's will. The apostles were devoted to Jesus' commands to love one another, to wait for the Holy Spirit, and then to go into all the world and make disciples. The first church was devoted to God's word, to fellowship with each other, and to prayer. Devotion is what Mary showed us in her initial response to Gabriel's announcement that she would bear the Messiah. She said, I am the Lord's service, servant. It was devotion that Joseph showed us in his willingness to take on a pregnant woman as his wife just because an angel told him it was the right thing to do. Devotion is what Jesus showed us at the Last Supper when he washed his disciples' feet knowing that they were about to desert him. And it's what the disciples showed us as they waited in the upper room for a promise that they didn't understand and that they could not quantify. Would you think about that with me for just a moment? If someone would have come and visited the apostles, the 120, in the upper room, if they would have asked, what are you waiting for? The answer would have been the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that mean? How will you know when he comes? What will he do when he gets here? They had no answers. They had no understanding. But they had devoted themselves to obedience. They then passed that devotion on to everyone that they led to Jesus. So let me ask this, this hard question today. Are we devoted? Now, I'm not going to allow this to drift into our personal applications today. I'm not going to ask you if you are devoted. I'm going to ask corporately, are we devoted? When you think of this church, your church, is devotion the first word that comes to mind? I'm going to be honest so that you don't feel like you're going to hurt my or anyone else's feelings. We are lacking in the devotion that Acts 2.42 speaks of. But I believe that this new season is calling us to a greater, a deeper, a more faithful commitment to devotion. Not as we want, as we understand, or as we've seen somewhere else, but a devotion as it is described in Acts chapter 2. A devotion to the things that every church must be devoted to so that we can be used to fulfill the purpose that every church has been called to. Bringing glory to Jesus that leads men to redemption. So the question is, and it's easily answered, but it needs to be expanded. What are those things? What are those things that the church, that our church, that every church, that the church is meant to be devoted to? Acts 2 tells us that the first church in Jerusalem devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This means that they first acknowledged that they needed to learn from each other. And I cannot emphasize that enough. You are not teachable if you think you already know. You are not teachable unless you are willing to acknowledge that others have things you need to learn. And so the beginning, the first characteristic of that early church was not that they loved the Word of God. It was that they considered themselves teachable. And by being teachable, they then learned and loved the Word of God. They acknowledged that they needed to learn from each other, from their experience with Jesus, and from their understanding of God's Word. God's Word was the standard for every part of their lives. Their marriages were lived from God's Word. Their children were raised from God's Word. Their jobs were worked from God's Word. But above all else, their, their relationships were walked out according to God's Word. See, the apostles were not just teaching the scriptures. They were teaching the scriptures in light of their life with Jesus. As we talk about so often, they were applying God's character to God's word. They weren't just quoting verses. They were giving examples and experiences. They were saying, the word says this, and Jesus obeyed it this way, and so this is what it's supposed to mean to us. That's part of what we're missing in our devotion. We're trying to learn blessings. We're trying to learn standards. We're trying to learn rules instead of knowing the character of God as it is revealed through the word of God so that the word of God doesn't become our devotional thought, doesn't become the fence that keeps us in, doesn't become our way of blessing, but it becomes the life that we live. And we live for Jesus by living like Jesus. Imagine what it did for the first church when the apostles would teach them about God's word as they saw it in the life of Jesus. Think about some practical things. How could they hold a grudge against, how could you hold a grudge against your brother when you heard about how Jesus washed Judas' feet? 
How could you be easily offended when you heard how Jesus wept over Jerusalem right before they turned on him? How could you feel inconvenienced by a need when you heard how Jesus healed all day and then prayed all night in Capernaum? How could you hold back forgiveness when you heard how Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do as he was dying on the cross. How could you be disappointed in a friend when you heard how Jesus encouraged Peter before Peter denied him and then went and restored Peter after Peter denied him? How could you choose your comfort or even your preference when you hear how Jesus said, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head? How could you ever be defensive when you heard how Jesus was silent before his accusers? How could you make room for any kind of prejudice when you heard how Jesus went to the well of a Samaritan, that he traveled to the island of a demoniac, and that he went and had a meal at the house of a tax collector? See, devotion to the apostles' teaching means for us what it meant for the church in Jerusalem, bringing everything in our lives into obedience with God's word, but also living from Jesus' example and making our feelings, our experiences, and our expectations subject to God's word and the life of Christ. And so let's backtrack for just a minute. We, I just asked you how they felt in those moments. Let me ask you now, how do you feel in those moments? Because the Word of God is doing the same thing in your life that it was doing in their life. The Holy Spirit is bringing the same conviction in our lives as He was bringing in their lives. So even today, if you struggle with forgiveness, how, does you, how do you respond when you think about how Jesus has forgiven you? If you struggle with anger, how do you respond when you see how Jesus treated His anger? If you struggle with feelings of depression, with feelings of anxiety, with feelings of worry? How do you respond when you see how Jesus was content and confident in his Father? See, it's not enough to quote the verses. We have to live the life. It's not enough to know the Word. We have to know the living Word. And we have to see how Jesus lived it out and then go and do likewise. Isn't that what he told the apostles in John 13 after he had washed their feet that they were to go and serve one another likewise? Isn't that what he said at the end of the parable of the Good Samaritan that it is not enough to just know you need to love God or to know you need to love your neighbor? You have to go and do likewise. And so I ask us today, are we doing the word of God in the same way Jesus did? Are we going and doing likewise or are we just learning for our benefit? Are we using God's word for our blessing? Or are we using God's word for our transformation and for his glory? The first church devoted itself to the word of God. The first church also devoted themselves to fellowship. The Greek word that's translated fellowship is koinonia. It's a very rich word with great depth. It is intimate partnership, joint and equal participation, and absolute uniting. To be devoted to the fellowship means that we understand that because we belong to Christ, we also belong to each other. It's taking the word of God literally and seriously and submitting ourselves to each other, joining ourselves to each other, and keeping ourselves with each other. Again, the first church had the apostles' experience with Jesus to use as their example. The apostles could have told stories about how they had argued with Jesus, about how they disagreed with Jesus, how they contradiction contradicted and even at times undermined Jesus, and yet he never broke fellowship with them. He rebuked them, he corrected them, but he loved them in the middle of all. Because Jesus remained steadfast not only to the Father's will, but also to the apostles' hearts. This is why Jesus prayed in John 17, None that you have given me has been lost except the son of perdition. Jesus was not only committed to the will of the Father, he was committed to those chosen by the Father. If I can be very honest, this is where we have fallen down the most as a church over the years. We have believed the lies of the enemy and of our culture, and we have tried to serve Jesus as individuals when we were created and called to serve him in fellowship with each other, in dependence upon God, and interdependence with each other. We have separated and scattered rather than gathering and holding on tight to one another. In the kingdom of God, if we are not connected with each other, we must begin to question our connection with God. If we are willing to separate from each other, we have to ask if we are willingly separating ourselves from God as well. In John chapter 13, Jesus gave the apostles very strict instructions. Serve each other as I have served you. Love each other as I have loved you. The world will know you are my disciples if you love one another. But it's not only called, we're not only called to love one another or to serve one another, we're then also called to forgive one another. Ephesians 4.32 
tells us, it quantifies it, that even as God has forgiven us in Christ Jesus, we are to forgive one another. Did you know that the Greek word that we translate one another, it's actually a single word that we've broken up, but in the New Testament it is used 100 times in 94 different verses? Do you think our relationships with each other are important? That that many times in that few small of a space that we are told how to treat each other, how to love one another, how to stay with one another, how to endure, how to be patient, how to be kind, how to be loving, how to be connected? It is a lie of the enemy that says we can be right with God and wrong with one another. It is a lie of the enemy that says that you can have a personal relationship with Jesus, but have broken fellowship with the church. We have this calling to love. We have this calling to serve. We have this calling to forgive. We have a calling to each other. Do we really believe 1 Corinthians 12, 26? When it tells us if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. If we believe it, we must stop allowing each other to suffer alone. We must stop trying to receive honor for ourselves, and instead we must share it with each other. If we're devoted to God's word, we will be devoted to fellowship. And if I can be blunt today, if we are not devoted to fellowship, we are not devoted to God's word. It is impossible to be one and not the other. It is like going back to the great commandments. You cannot love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and not love your neighbor as yourself. One leaks into the other. Jesus said that the second was like the first. He said everything else in the law hangs on those two things. So do you know what that means? If you keep all 600 plus Shemas of the Old Testament law, but you do not love God and you do not love your neighbor, none, none of it matters. None of it stands up. None of it holds up. And so for us, and I know that we don't have to keep the law, but I'll say it for us. You can go to church. You can read your Bible. You can pray without ceasing. You can do all the things that we think Christians are supposed to do. If everything isn't built on loving God with all of our being and loving one another as Christ has loved us, then none of it matters. All of it's religious, unless it's birthed out of love, and unless it's for the purpose of showing more love. First church was committed, they were devoted to fellowship, which means they were devoted to God's people. Luke then writes that the first church was devoted to the breaking of bread, which simply further describes their fellowship. Forgive me for just one second, it has nothing to do with communion. It has nothing to do with the Lord's Supper, what we're going to do later. That is not what it means. It doesn't mean that they devoted themselves to taking communion. It is talking about their relationships with each other. Later on in the chapter, it says that the first church met together in the temple every day, and then they ate their meals together in their homes every night. The breaking of bread is included so that we will understand that it's impossible to have fellowship in spiritual matters and not have it in social matters. That it is impossible to be connected at church and not to be connected in one another's lives. That what starts in church must spill over into each other's homes or else it's not fellowship. See, if fellowship was just about spiritual things, why didn't Jesus, Jesus just have the disciples meet him at the synagogue on the Sabbath? If fellowship was just about ministry, why didn't Jesus just have, have the disciples meet him on the days when he was going to teach his parables and heal and work miracles? See, Jesus taught us that fellowship looked like, Jesus taught us what fellowship looked like by living with his disciples. And the disciples taught us what devotion to fellowship looks like by leaving everything to follow Jesus. I'm not talking about living communally, but I am talking about living in community. And I know I'm going to make some of us uncomfortable, but being devoted to fellowship means we should be in each other's homes. And I understand we're under certain guidelines, so I'm not talking about breaking the CDC's rules. I'm not talking about being unwise. I'm talking about being in one another's lives. You should have been invited to my house, and I should have been invited to yours. We should have places of fellowship outside of the service. We should be in friendship with each other. We should be invested in each other's children. We should be praying for each other's needs, and we should be celebrating each other's honors. Fellowship is not the equivalent of eating meals. It's joining each other's lives. The breaking of bread is similar to when Jesus taught us to pray for our daily bread in the Lord's Prayer. That prayer means that we ask and we trust God with everything that we will need for life. The fellowship means to include and invest in each other in every part of our lives. 
If worshiping together doesn't lead to living together, then we are not devoting ourselves to fellowship. The first church was devoted to each other. They were devoted to God's people. Looking further through Acts 2, it's important that we see what devotion to fellowship produced. Verse 43 says that they were filled with awe, which means worship. They lived worshipful lives because somehow, when we are in fellowship with each other, the supremacy and beauty of Christ is never out of our view. When we are in right fellowship, I see Jesus in you and you see Jesus in me, so that when we're together, there is more awe of Christ than there is even agreement with each other. That it's not even about enjoying one another's company, it's about rejoicing in the presence of God that I see in your life and that you see in mine. And so Somehow, when fellowship is done rightly, when we are devoted to fellowship, it increases our worship. See, worship does not flow from the songs we sing, but from the relationships we commit ourselves to. The songs get sweeter when we live in fellowship with one another. Miracles and wonders were performed by the apostles because somehow fellowship creates an atmosphere for the miraculous. They were together, they were of one mind and had all things in common, meaning they had committed themselves to each other. It says that many sold their possessions and goods and gave to anyone as he had need, so much so that there was no needy among them. When we choose devotion to God's word and devotion to fellowship, it opens our hearts to submit everything in our lives to God's use for God's glory. In devotion, our relationships are for God's glory. Our money is for God's glory. Our households, our talents are for God's glory. It's not just that it all comes from God or it all belongs to God, but that God has put it in our hands so that Jesus can be seen, known, loved, and glorified. Forgive me for a minute if this steps on your toes or if it is opposed to your own sensibilities. But rather than us trying to figure out how to make a living, we need to learn how to put our attention on how to glorify Jesus. Rather than us trying to figure out how to do better for ourselves, we need to do better for the kingdom. Rather than us trying to figure out what we can do so that we can get ahead, we need to figure out what we're called to do so that we can add souls to the kingdom. This life is not our own. We were bought with a price. And it is not about having what we need here. It is about depending on the one who created us and has made a place for us where he is. Our lives belong to Jesus, which means we must be committed to his glory in all things. If our lives are not our own because we've been bought with a price, then everything in our lives is to be devoted to the one who bought us for his glory and for the good that he will do in us, through us, and for us. Once more, the first church was devoted to God's people. Finally, Luke writes that the first church devoted themselves to prayer. Of all the things the apostles saw Jesus do, the only thing they ever asked him to teach them was to pray. In Luke chapter 11, we are told that Jesus was praying, and when he finished, one of the disciples asked, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. It's important that we understand that these were men who prayed. They had been trained as children. They went to the synagogue. They made annual pilgrimages to the temple in Jerusalem. These were men who knew how to pray. They just didn't know how to pray like Jesus. When they heard Jesus pray, they realized that his prayers were different. His prayers were not just effective, they were intimate. They were conversational. They were not just motions he was going through or religious ob obligations he was fulfilling. They were a relationship that he actually had with God, that God was his father. Jesus' prayer didn't just cause God to move. Jesus' prayers didn't just cause God to move. They exposed the reality of God's constant presence. That's what our prayers are supposed to do. They're not just supposed to work miracles. They're supposed to make people around us believe God is here. That man, that woman, that family, they pray like God is with them. They pray like God is listening. They pray like they know God is right there. That's what our prayers are supposed to be. They don't have to be eloquent. They don't have to be loud. They don't have to make sense to anyone else, but they have to be confident in the one that we're talking to and his nearness to us at all times. That's what the apostles taught the first church. Not just how to pray, but how to pray like Jesus. How to pray with intimacy, with an open ear and not just an open mouth. How to pray with faith that was sure that they were heard and that they would be answered. How to pray with a willingness to pour out their hearts to God, but also a longing to have God pour his heart out to them. Prayers that were honest and humble. Prayers that didn't just seek to move God, but that desired to be moved by God. 
Prayers that didn't just change circumstances, but prayers that changed the hearts of those who were praying. The first church devoted themselves to God's presence through prayer. Acts chapter 2, verse 45, says, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. The key phrase there is one accord. We see this description of the first church ten times in the book of Acts, but I've got to ask today, what does it mean? Were they devoted to each other because they were in one accord? Was their devotion the outcome of having found people they agreed with, felt comfortable around, or had things in common with? Or was it that their devotion to each other in the midst of difference, disagreement, and discomfort created one accord? See, the Greek phrase that we translate as one accord is a compound of two words, one meaning to rush along, the other meaning in unison. So one accord literally means to rush along in unison. Strong's Concordance gives this description. The image is almost musical. A number of notes are sounded which, while different, harmonize in pitch and in tone. As the instruments of a great concert, under the direction of a concert master, so the Holy Spirit blends together the lives of the members of the Christian church. It's the devotion that creates the unity. It's the commitment that creates the fellowship. It's the humility that creates the honor. It's the decision to be together that creates the one accord. Too many of us are looking for a place where we fit rather than the place we belong. What's the difference? I think the difference is actually simple. One is where we want to be. The other is where we were meant to be. One checks off all of our boxes, but the other will satisfy our soul. One makes us comfortable. The other challenges us to be changed. And so I've got to ask you today, are we choosing commitment so that we can be in one accord, or are we waiting for one accord before we can make a commitment? It is the decision that leads to the fellowship, and it is the fellowship that leads to the unity. See, devoted can no longer be a theme for a year. It must be the identity of our church. It must be the identity of the church. I'm praying that we will realize that we can't be separate and together. We can't resist one another and connect with each other at the same time. I'm praying that we will understand that we build relationships through devotion and we build unity through commitment. I'm praying that we will understand that community is simply the result of consistent relationships and outreach is the expanding of that community to others through the example of our devotion. Outreach is when others see our relationships with each other and with Christ and desire to have those relationships with each other. Outreach is when we live rightly as the body of Christ. You know what outreach looked like for the first church? It looked like them loving one another as Jesus had loved them. And then the whole world, the city of Jerusalem watching and saying, now we know they are his disciples. Devotion is, our witness is, our calling is, our outreach is when people see love, when they see service, when they see forgiveness, when they see difference and commitment, when they see diversity, then those who long for those places are drawn to the body of Christ. We want them to hear our message, but they're watching our witness. We want them to listen to our sermons and they are listening to our conversations. We want them to come and follow our example and yet our example isn't something we're putting a lot of energy into. And so I'm going to ask us today to search our own hearts and to search our own lives and to search our own church and to say very honestly, are we looking for people who agree with us or are we committing ourselves to the people that God has placed us with? You guys have heard me talk about this a lot in the last couple of months, but we need to learn how to have conversations with people that are different from us. We need to learn how to ask people where they're from and what they've seen rather than just tell, looking for someone that can nod their head yes when we tell our own story. We need people whose stories make us uncomfortable. I want to tell you the truth. We need people who when they tell their story, we feel cut to the core. People who, when they tell us their story, it wells up tears in our eyes. People who, when they tell us the story, not because we feel bad for them, but because we see Christ in it. And we see conviction in our own lives, in our own beliefs, in our own thoughts, and in our own ideas. 
You see, that's the most important, you see, the, the most important outcome of devotion in the Acts chapter 2 church is not just that they lived in one accord. It's not just that they lived generously with one another. It's that their devotion caused the Lord to add to their number daily. Isn't that what we want? I hope that's what you're praying for. It's what I pray for every day. God, save souls in Burlington today. Save souls in this county today. Save souls in New Jersey today. It's what I pray every day. And if it's not what you're praying, please start praying it. But here's the truth. If we want him to answer that prayer, we have to devote ourselves to the things that lead to the answer. So the first church, God was safe. God felt sure. God knew that they, he could add to their number daily. Why? Because daily they devoted themselves to the word of God, to the people of God, and to the presence of God. Daily they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and to prayer. When we devote ourselves rightly, God can add to us exponentially. And I'm not talking about a church getting big. I'm talking about the kingdom adding souls. Because you've heard me say it before, and I mean it with all my heart. It does not matter to me how big our church ever gets as long as our church makes the kingdom grow. And so I don't care where the souls end up sitting in pews. I just care that the souls get to where they were created to be. That our devotion leads to their names being written in God's book. God's promises for Burlington are summed up in this. He desires to pour his spirit out in this city and from this city. He desires for souls to be saved, for sinners to be forgiven, for the bound to be set free, for the broken to be healed, for Jesus to be the Lord of the hearts of every single one of our neighbors. How will he do that? Through our devotion. There is no room to be disconnected, uninvolved, or self-consumed. There is no room to be separate in disagreement or give bitterness a foothold through offense. There is no room to get lost in our emotions, stay immature in our feelings, or long for things to be the way we want them to be or the way we remember them being in the past. We belong to Jesus, which means we must belong to each other. And that belonging is not for our comfort, it is for Jesus' glory, and it is for the salvation and the redemption of the world we live in. Now, more than ever, we must intentionally and creatively work to grow in our devotion to God's word, to fellowship, to our relationships, and to prayer. Today, what I'm asking for us, I'm asking is for us to search our hearts and our lives and to see if we are willing to make a commitment to consistent, faithful relationship, a commitment to get out of our own lives and invest in the lives of others, a commitment to become a church that God can use to receive those that, that he wants to add to the kingdom of Christ Day. Are we willing to be devoted? Are we ready to be changed? Will we allow God to have his way? His way is always the same. Devotion to him, devotion to each other, and devotion to anything that glorifies Jesus and anything that leads men to redemption. Devotion is usually a challenge to what we desire. Devotion is almost always a challenge to our preferences and to what we are comfortable with. But for those that are willing to move out of themselves and let God do what he wants rather than what they desire, what they have believed or been taught, devotion leads to transformation. And transformation allows God to produce incredible fruit. As we prepare to finish, I just want to talk about this first church. Because I don't want to act like they were perfect. They just set a perfect example. Here's what I mean. Their devotion challenged them. Their devotion led them to some things they were uncomfortable with. Their devotion caused them to change the way they thought, even the way that they believed. The first issue that the church ever, ever dealt with in their devotion to the, to the word of God and in their devotion to prayer, the first issue they ever had to deal with was their devotion to fellowship. When the Hellenistic widows, when the Hellenistic Jews had to go to the apostles and say, our widows aren't getting the same amount of food that the Hebraic widows are getting. Isn't it interesting that there was already an ethnic divide? There was already a racial divide. That people that were devoting themselves to fellowship still were struggling with each other. They were called to go to Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, and yet they got comfortable in Jerusalem. 
And they stayed in Jerusalem until finally, when Peter was, excuse me, when um, Stephen was executed, when he was murdered, and then persecution began and they had to scatter, not because they were obeying the word, but because they had no choice. Finally, the scripture, the, the word started to go to the ends of the earth. But even then, as the gospel was being spread, as Gentiles were starting to believe, the, the, those back in Jerusalem started to question. Rather than rejoice, they sent a witness. They sent a spy if we want to know the truth. The same way Israel had sent spies into the promised land, they sent Barnabas to go to Antioch. Go see if this is what they say it is. Thank God that Barnabas was more devoted to fellowship than he was to tradition. Thank God that Barnabas was more devoted to the promise of God than he was to the traditions of his nation. Thank God that Barnabas was more devoted to truth than he was comfort. Mm -hmm. And so when he saw their difference, what he also saw was the grace of God and he encouraged them to continue in the Lord. And even that wasn't enough. They still had to have a meeting. They had to have a council in Acts chapter 15 where they had to gather everybody around. Peter had had a vision that said Gentiles are welcome. This, the gospel was spreading and Gentiles were being saved. Barnabas saw the church in Antioch and said, this is the real thing. I see the grace of God. And they still sat around and goes, maybe we should have a meeting about this. <laughs> and it was in that meeting that they argued and they argued and they argued. And finally, Peter stood up. Which I've got to tell you, it seems he was reluctant to do so. And he stood up in his own discomfort and what may have been his own reluctance. And he told the story of his vision that God had given him and how he saw the spirit move in Cornelius' household of Gentiles. And finally they said, okay. Guys, what will it take for us to let God break the yoke of our divisions? of our discomforts, of our clinging to narratives that just aren't true, and our attempts to get back to things that never actually happen? What will it take for the body of Christ to be devoted to Jesus by being devoted to each other, no matter what our differences may be? We, at this hour more than any other, have an opportunity to be the people of God, by devoting ourselves to the things that God desires and the things that matter to God. His word, his people, and his presence. I'm going to repeat myself here because I think it's important. Devotion is usually a challenge to what we desire, but it is always a challenge to our preferences and to the things that we are comfortable with. But for those that are willing to move out of themselves and let God do what he wants rather than what they desire, what they have believed or been taught, devotion leads to transformation. And transformation allows God to produce fruit that lasts. I'm asking you to make a commitment to God that will lead us to a commitment to each other. Will we choose devotion? Will we learn devotion? Will we let God build in us? community that he can use to save others? Will we become a safe place, a devoted place that God says, I can add to their number daily? Today, I'm going to ask us to actually take a step in that direction, and we're going to have our first act of devotion, and that is to take communion together. I know this doesn't feel like we're together, but I want us to make sure that our hearts are joined to each other's. I know we often view communion as a personal thing, but it's important that we remember that it was and it is a corporate experience. Jesus didn't serve each of the apostles. He served all of them. He broke the bread and he passed it. He took the cup and he passed it. That means that they were not only served by Jesus, they then served each other. Communion doesn't only unite us to Jesus, it unites us to one another. It is not only a call to remember what Jesus has done, but it is a call to take responsibility for who we are called to be. In communion, we don't, say, we don't only say, thank you, Jesus. We must also say, yes, Lord. We give thanks for what he has done, but then we commit ourselves every single time we eat and we drink. We commit ourselves to living for Jesus by living like Jesus, to loving him by obeying his commands that we would love one another, even as he has loved us, that we would go into the world and make disciples of all nations, that we would love the Lord our God with all of our mind, our soul, and our strength, and that we would love our neighbor even as we love ourselves. 
When we take communion, we're not being saved all over again. But we are recommitting ourselves to the salvation that we have been given. Communion is one of the greatest ways that the redeemed of the Lord say so. And that we commit ourselves to joining God in the work of redemption. There is this one final thing that we do together in communion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, Paul wrote, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Communion is a proclamation of what Jesus has done, and it is a loud, resounding reminder that Jesus is coming. When we eat and we drink, we are saying, thank you, Jesus. We are saying, yes, Lord. And we are also saying, come quickly. And we are saying it together. I know that I often, and, and you've often heard it other places, and I've done it as well, I often give the encouragement to close ourselves up with Jesus as we prepare to eat and drink, but I'm not sure that's the proper encouragement. I think we're supposed to connect ourselves with one another. Jesus didn't serve each of those 11 men that were left at the table. He served them all together. They ate together. They drank together. We have to learn how to live together. And so we have to learn how to be in communion with one another. And so today, I want us to take and eat and drink together. So I'm going to ask the worship team to start to prepare to come back now. And they're going to lead us through one song. And I'm going to ask you to begin preparing the elements that you have there. And then as they finish that song, I'm going to lead us to take communion. But I want to prepare you. We're going to do it much differently today. So get ready, all of you that are watching, whomever you're watching with, let's prepare our hearts and let's be ready to not just eat and not just drink, but to eat and drink together.
that you have your elements there ready. That you have the bread which represents the body of Christ. It's broken for our sins. That you have the cup which represents the blood of Jesus. That became the cup of the new covenant. That became the forgiveness of our sins. That became our redemption. That didn't just take us from being crimson to being white as snow. But made us the sons and the daughters of God. His blood signed our adoption papers. Would you just, where you are, just sit and look together at the bread. And look together at the wine. And realize that you hold in your hands the symbol of your salvation. But you hold in your hands the symbol of the salvation of the people that sit with you. You hold in your hands the symbol of the salvation of all those who came before us. Right now, you're holding the symbol of the salvation of your greatest enemy. You are holding the salvation of the person that harmed you the most. You are holding the symbol of the salvation of the people you agree with and the people you disagree with. You are holding the symbol of the salvation of both the persecutor and the persecuted, of both of those in bondage and those who hold in bondage. You are holding in your hands the symbol of salvation for all. Take that in for a minute. This is not your salvation. It is the salvation. And there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. And so he has saved us, thank God, but he came to save all. And so we cannot close ourselves in any longer. And we cannot limit our circle any longer. And we cannot divide in disagreement any longer. Because the same bread the same wine represents the one body and the one blood that changes everything and that has the power to change everyone. Real briefly, I'm going to throw a little bit of a curveball here because I told the worship team that they were going to partake afterwards. I think it's important that they partake with you and that we partake together. And so while Veronica plays just a little longer, I'm going to serve them. Thank you, Jesus. 
repeat after me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come quickly. Come quickly. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come quickly. Come quickly. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Come quickly. Come quickly. Let's eat. Let's drink. Heavenly Father, I thank you today that there is one faith and there is one baptism. There is one God and one Father of us all. I thank you that there is one body yes. because there was only one blood. Thank you that there is one salvation and it is available to all. And so today, God, I thank you that your heart's desire is that your people would walk with you and would walk with each other so that you have a place to put your new saints. And so I pray today, God, let us be the body of Christ. May you take our brokenness and make it perfect. I pray today that we would be washed in the blood of Jesus, that we would live in its power, that we would live in its truth, that we would live in its majesty, that we would be blood-bought, and that we would desire that same redemption for all who live around us. I pray today that we would be a people who have devoted themselves to you by devoting ourselves to each other. And so, God, I pray that as we take this new journey, as we take this new step, as we step into this new season that begins today, that has begun today, I pray that we would do it with devotion. And so I pray, make this church, make City of Refuge a devoted people. Make us a people devoted to the Word of God more than ever before. Make us a people devoted to fellowship, to the people of God more than ever before. Make us uncomfortable and let us enjoy the discomfort because we know that it is creating a harvest of righteousness. May we be devoted to prayer. May we not just build bridges through prayer. May we build strongholds. Yes. May we build cities. May we build kingdoms yes. through prayer. Yes. May we be a people of devotion, a people who will not be shaken but a people who are always ready to be changed. Thank you today for your kindness that has drawn us to repentance. May it lead us not just to salvation. May it lead us to transformation. May it lead us to devotion. Make us a people who live for Jesus by living like Jesus. And may you receive all of the glory and all of the honor. And may our lives, may our church, Lead to souls being saved. Lead to bondages being broken. Lead to bodies being healed. Lead to devils being cast out. Lead to the dead being raised. And lead to your kingdom coming. Your will being done. In this city. Even as it is in heaven. We love you. We thank you. And we ask you to have your way in us so that you can have your way through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for watching with us today. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I pray today that the Word of God has found a place in your heart where it can create a harvest. I pray that the worship has stirred something in your spirit to bear witness with His spirit. I pray that the communion would lead you to a place of deeper devotion, not just with Christ, but for Christ. We are so thankful to have you here with us. If there is anything we can do to serve you, if you have prayer requests, if you have needs, whether they're financial or physical, that we can pray for, that we can help with, please leave comments, please send messages. It is a joy and a privilege to be able to lead you. It is a joy and a privilege to be able to walk together. But let's remember what the word says. How can two walk together unless they agree to do so? I pray today that we would agree, not just with each other, but that we would agree to be with each other, because that's what God has called us to be. 
God bless you. Wednesday night again for the Zoom discussion of the book of Revelation. There will be more announcements coming throughout the course of this week. Keep an eye on our Facebook page. Keep an eye on our YouTube page. Keep an eye on your email if you're on our email list. If you'd like to be on the email list, please just drop your email here in the comments or send us a message. If this message has affected you, if it has encouraged you or strengthened you in any way, please let us know. Please leave comments. Please ask questions. If there are things you'd like to talk about, reach out in the messages and we'll be sure to connect with you. God bless you. We look forward to the day when we are together in body, but for now, we rejoice at knowing that we are together in spirit. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May he make his countenance lift upon you and give you peace. God bless you.